did some. I've never, I've never actually uh, worked with a team to manage one here. So if there's some glitches, well, so be it. I guess we're all kind of in this together, right? This uh, bizarre new world here. Of course, what we'd all much rather be doing is reaching out to you personally and speaking with you personally, but here we are. Um, so welcome, welcome. Thank you all for joining us. We have a, a great team here. You're looking at them now. So these are all, these are some of the folks that have been working with One People, One Reef over the years. So let me just give you a little overview about what we're gonna be doing here tonight. Um, you're gonna be hearing from the team members you see here. So look at their faces and get used to them. And each of them is gonna share with you the work that they're doing with One People, One Reef. I'm gonna start off with an overview. First, Travis is gonna start off with some housekeeping. So um, when he's done with that, um, we're gonna get into the presentation. And what we'll be doing here is um, talking about this organization, One People, One Reef. We'll be talking to you a little bit about the history. So we're gonna frame the organization, talk about its history. We'll talk about our accomplishments um, to date. Um, we'll look at a window into our future, where we're going. And then John Magul Romal is gonna walk you through the program from the local community's perspective. Then we're gonna delve into some of the details of our work. So the people that you see here are gonna talk about the science and the youth program and the work that they're all doing. We're gonna wrap up with ways that you can get involved. And finally, we're gonna have time at the end for questions and answers. So please stay for a chance to interact and chat with us on chat. And we encourage you to post your questions throughout the evening and, um, and the amazing Travis is gonna keep track of that. I'm gonna now pass it off to him. He's gonna be monitoring that. So please do stick around to the end. If you have questions, we'll have um, a bunch of time at the end that we planned to answer those. So Travis, I'm gonna pass it off to you. Thank you so much for the introduction, Nicole. Like she said, my name is Travis and I have been working with One People, One Reef uh, since about March of this year. So not too long, but with what I've seen in terms of the work they've accomplished and working with the people here, it's really opened my eyes to an incredible pathway towards conservation. So I'm very excited to be a part of this team. Now, as Nicole said, I'll be working with, uh, just letting you all know about some basic Zoom housekeeping. I'm sure you're all pretty Zoomed out at this point, but just to make sure we're all on the uh, same page, we're gonna ask everybody to remain on mute uh, while the presentation and the community meeting is active. Uh, but you're of course very encouraged to participate with us and to engage with us. So like Nicole mentioned, there's the chat button down below and you're welcome to post in any questions or comments during that. And we'll be able to uh, monitor that and let people know uh, and address your comments and your questions. And for the mo majority of the questions, we will be saving them till the end for the question and answer period. But if it's particularly pressing, uh, we can try and address it at that moment. All right, now uh, I'm sure you may have heard at the uh, beginning of this as well, this meeting is being recorded. So if you are uncomfortable with having your face on screen, we totally understand. So you are welcome to stop your video, but we do ask uh, and encourage again that people let us uh, talk to us in chat because this is a virtual community meeting and you're gonna learn a lot more about what that means. So on that note, I will be passing it on to Michelle. Hello, this is Michelle. I am one of the original founding members of One People, One Reef. This working with One People, One Reef, this creation has really changed my life. It changed what I felt like it meant to be a scientist. I became a scientist because I'm in love with the oceans and wanted to do something to help them. And One People, One Reef and the community of Ulithi has taught me how deeply important also cultural conservation is and how the diversity of humans across the planet will directly be related to the diversity of the environment and our health are interrelated and that actually giving me so much hope seeing that we can actually have supportive communities with humans and nature coexisting really strongly. And so that's really the root of our vision is, is that collaborative nature of innovative solutions for resilience, both in the reefs and the communities of the people who rely on them. And we do that by developing innovative and diverse partnerships that are really designed to achieve effective and enduring protection of these critical marine habitats and really importantly, the amazing people who rely on them. We do this capacity building through this very unique collaborative approach where we're really strongly integrating traditional and local knowledge and practices with modern science and technologies. This creates innovative solutions that allows us to step forward into this world in a much more resilient and supportive way. 
So this slide is a bit of a diagram that really shows the heart of how we work. We mentioned the word collaborative and it truly is there. So you see on the left, this yellow box is the science team, people like me, all of the different aspects of the science, but we work really very strongly with the community. And you'll hear a bit about, a, a lot about that community collaboration. And all of that is feeding into, it's this interactive feedback with the community, integrating the communities into the science, integrating their knowledge into our science and coming back into building capacity building. And it's all in support of making sure that our ecosystems and our cultures remain resilient and strong. So I'll pass it on to Nicole. Okay. Nicole, unmute yourself. <laughs> there we go. Okay, <laughs> the classic uh, problem. Um, so I, I'm going to start off here with, um, with um, a couple of thank yous. So one of them is going to be to Scott Davis. And you'll see a lot of his images in, in the slides that we are all showing you. ScottDavisImages.com is his website. He's accompanied us to the Outer Islands. He takes magnificent pictures. So you'll be seeing a lot of his pictures here today. And there are so many people to thank. Um, it's really a little bit overwhelming. So most of our work to date, actually really all of it um, with One People, One Reef is in the Western Pacific. And this is a coral reef biodiversity hotspot, meaning it has extremely high biodiversity. It's also a region where indigenous local people are the primary managers and stewards of their marine resources. And this is an extremely important point. The people who live in the outer islands steward over a million square kilometers of critical coral reef habitat. And they do it very well and they have been doing it very well for many many years things have changed though recently and along with those changes have come challenges um, however once again back to the autonomy of the people who live and utilize these resources bringing back traditional management and talking about what's causing the changes with the community as as we've been doing has been showing incredibly um, powerful results as opposed to coming to people with a plan that was originated in some academic hallway somewhere and then um, imposing that plan on people, which often doesn't work very well. So everything we've been doing is very organic. It's done, as Michelle mentioned, in collaboration with people. So a little bit about the history. I was um, um, invited to a Ulithia Atoll. So let's take a look at where this is mm. here. So um, here is um, some of you are familiar with Japan. Here's Japan, there's Guam. And then a Yap state and the Federated States of Micronesia consists of four states, one of which is Yap. And the outer islands of Yap and some outer islands of Chuuk are the two regions where we have been primarily working um, for the past 10 years. Moving a little closer, here's Yap state. Here's Ulithi Atoll, which you'll be hearing um, more about today because this is where our project started. It's the fourth largest atoll in the world. And um, here we have the outer islands. So we have expanded our program to the four inhabited islands of Ulithi and then all the way out to Satawal, which is the farthest um, outer island, and then into Chuuk. And um, whoop, there we go. So I was invited out to, here's a, these are the low-lying islands of Ulithi Atoll. And you can see, uh, most of you know um, that many of these low-lying atolls are in trouble with climate change. However, rather than focusing on the trouble of rising sea level, we've instead been focusing on the positive outcomes of people reviving traditional management and working with the coral reefs to bring back the, the biomass of fish and the reefs themselves. Um, originally, when I was invited to Ulithi, um, the question posed to me was, what should we do? We're having trouble with our fish, we're having trouble with our reefs, and, and we're not quite sure what to do. And it occurred to me at that time that speaking with people, I didn't know what they should do. I didn't think I should have a plan for what they should do. They, they are the ones that live there and, and they know better to how to manage their resources than I would. But what I promised them is that we would discuss the issues I would go back, pull together a team, and see if we could collaboratively address, first identify, and then address some of those problems and find some solutions. Um, Ulithi Atoll is um, a, an incredibly beautiful place. It's one of the closest land sites to um, the Marianas Trench. Some of you may be familiar with James Cameron's Challenger expedition, which was staged um, actually out of Ulithi Atoll, but I'm going to let 
um, John Wilmall talk about that because uh, he was there for that. Um, this is the island of Federai. These are, it's very, very deep water um, next to these islands. Um, as I said, they have incredibly um, beautiful biodiversity. And one of the things that we have found about these islands is that they are resilient. And this is a, a term that is sort of a, a catch-all term in conservation today. Which places are resilient and where should we be focusing our conservation efforts? Should we just leave alone those places that don't seem very resilient and, and they may not be able to bounce back? So our approach has been to leave all of those decisions to the people who rely on, steward, and utilize those reefs. And indeed, in the West Pacific, many of these reefs are quite resilient. A little bit about what we've done and accomplished. We've conducted reef surveys and innovative research programs on over 70 sites throughout the Outer Islands. All of our research is applied to management. So all of our research is done in the context of what the people need and the context of, of what they could utilize in order to manage more effectively. So we talk with them, we help let them help us uh, guide on what questions we're gonna ask. As we collect data, we also uh, convey that information to the people. We have many, many community meetings about it. We've also conducted management planning and surveys on nine outer island atolls, placing over 60% of their reefs under management. This is more than all of the global benchmarks. So I wanna give a shout out right here to the outer island people. They have exceeded the global conservation and biodiversity benchmarks globally. Um, and I don't mean to take any credit for that 60%. That is the management that the people of the outer islands are doing. And they're working with us to support them in that process. Um, we've conducted several workshops on fisheries and reef management. Um, the people of the outer islands have participated in the largest artisanal fisheries database in the region. They have helped us um, collect data on over 90,000 fish and they do the data collection. Um, they they uh, catch the fish, they measure the fish, they look at if it's male or female, they enter the data onto a spreadsheet. The spreadsheet goes by canoe, by motorboat, by small plane to another island where it's entered into a computer, put onto a thumb drive, it's taken then by another boat or canoe or plane to a main island, uploaded to us, and then we take a look at the data. So it's uh, exciting, complicated, um, but it's been working. We've also in, um, conducted over eight years of youth programming. So you'll be hearing tonight that um, youth engagement is a critical part of what we do. They are our future. Uh, we have produced a best practices manual that the youth are working on now and educational materials. And of course, we've developed many, many partnerships to do this. Um, this is definitely not a small operation. So we have been able to do this through our partnerships. We've also written papers, uh, engaged in seminars and symposia. So my final comment here is that this is the, the, the system that we are all working in here is a complex social ecological system, meaning that the people are closely tied to their ecology. The ecological system affects the people and the people affect the system. And putting people at the center of those efforts ensures a greater success. If we only focus on the environment and come up with plans to protect it, it's not going to work if people rely on that environment. Um, we have uh, also been funded by National Geographic for a, I encourage you to go to this website. It's a fantastic project, not again taking credit. This was a collaborative effort here. Our One People, One Reef storytelling project, linking the science and traditions of coral reef stewardship on the outer islands through the revitalization of storytelling, a really exciting project. Um, we have been funded over the years by a number of organizations and, and agencies, including the National Science Foundation, NOAA, Nature Conservancy, you'll see them all listed here, um, Packard Foundation. Our organization is now moving into a new chapter in its life, and that's part of what we're here to talk to you about today. While this funding has allowed us to grow at an extremely fast rate, actually a little bit too fast for us, so we've been expanding very quickly, it is tied to very specific funding and grants in this case. So um, we have now incorporated as a 501c3 nonprofit organization so we can be more flexible with our funding and with accepting monies in different ways. We're expanding the islands we serve, so our organization is growing. We're partnering with Revive and Restore, you'll hear more about that on innovative projects and genetics. We're expanding our partnership with island conservation for eradication work, you're gonna hear more about that as well. And we're embarking on a really exciting partnership to investigate the role isotopes can play in telling the story of reef health and restoration. And Kelton McMahon is here tonight. So we're working with the University of Rhode Island and the Claremont McKenna schools on that effort. 
We're also working more closely with regional and national governments to protect on protected area planning and implementation on a, on a larger scale. So uh, When People, One Reef um, has a unique approach to solving some of our planet's most pressing problems, and our collaborative conservation solutions are working. So this has been very, very exciting for us. And in fact, we started um, on a, what we would consider, we're going to use a canoe analogy here. So you saw in the invitation that this is a virtual community meeting. And a community meeting is a place where each person has an opportunity to voice their concerns and, and give their input. Um, and the canoe analogy is about how it really takes a team to move something forward on a voyage where you're not exactly sure where you're going or what the outcome will be, although you all know that you're going to be going someplace great. And each member of that canoe has an extremely important role to play. So we started on this small canoe here, and we embarked on a journey to try to help one community um, uh, revive some of their fish stocks. And um, this was incredibly successful. We then expanded throughout Ulithi Atoll. So our, our canoe got a bit bigger, put a sail on it. So we went to more places. Um, we began to voyage beyond Ulithi to the outer islands where we um, worked with communities that were even farther out. And we are now working to build a voyaging canoe, a larger, more robust voyaging canoe. And here you see a canoe builder from the island of Satawal um, the experts themselves, these, this, by the way, is the um, epicenter on the planet of the great voyaging navigators. Um, so we're working together now to build a voyaging canoe to expand our program even farther. Our passion is the importance of collaborative conservation. There is so much conservation happening today that is not collaborative, and it doesn't meet the same goals that we need. So we, our real passion here is to work collaboratively. And we feel it's extremely important to get this story and that initiative to a global stage. So as we embark on this journey with you, um, you're going to be learning more about the different things that, that we're all doing with One People, One Reef. So once again, please ask questions. Um, please put them in the chat. And Travis will be um, monitoring those. So I'm going to be passing it off here to John Wilmall. And he's going to be sharing his slides. Oops, you're muted. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for all of that. Um, my name is John, or Junior, to some of you. Um, I want to start with a shout out to the communities, uh, the elders, dead or alive, who I stand on their shoulders today to be able to bring uh, uh, some of our traditions do to light. And so my respect to all the elders here and, and those that I, I represent today. And I'd like to um, start off by um, <clears throat> adding on a little bit to what Nicole is talking about and that's the collaboration piece. Um, you know, that, that was long and I, I, I feel like a lot of times we don't see we as indigenous folks have, um, you know, consider ourselves less of an importance or not, not important enough to come to the to the table, and that has limited our success in, in in reviving our tradition. And so, to the indigenous groups out there, we have to make ourselves important and bring our story to the front for the world to hear. So, with that. Here's my view growing up on this island. You know, I look at the horizon, I've always been wondering what is behind the horizon, you know? And so for me, it took me to leave these horizon to actually lift the horizon and go see the Western uh, world to have a better appreciation for my culture. And so um, let's just elaborate how fast that horizon is. Now, before we get into the canoe, and I will be talking to you a little bit about the canoe analogy because I feel like um, that's the fabric, the foundation of what makes uh, our Ulithi society work and continue to, to work today. Um, this slide, I wanted to show you that we have not been, you know, it hasn't been a smooth ride. You know, those of you who uh, I saw earlier, you know, Ulithi has had its fair share of history. Uh, 1945 being the largest Navy base in the world. And so, and 
so it's it's still I'm still very grateful that today we there's some remnants despite all of that history. There's some remnants of the structure that I could stand up in front of you, all you people and say, oh, there's there's still something unique and protected, yeah. And so, so here's a canoe. Here's a Micronesian canoe with a crew. Uh, shout out to Larry. Uh, I know you're here. This is Larry of Wage, who, who I uh, stole this video from. Um, so my two points um, important. There's so many different things that makes a canoe uh, work, and we're going to have. We can't go through all of that now. But the two important points here I want to I want to talk about is respect one and collaboration as Nicole uh, alluded to. So the canoe has has to be the crew has to be not only brave but trust each other's expertise in order for this voyage to move forward. And so hopefully um, by the end of this conversation you will see that we will demonstrate the different parts, the different crew members that have now come together to sail this new canoe in a new era of uncharted waters via whether it's climate change or on any of the other challenges, environmental challenges that we face today. So this is the main uh, parts. This is a canoe in action, for example. Uh, so you're familiar with it uh, because we will be moving towards a little bit um, into the structure of Ulithi community and it'll resemble the different parts of the canoe. Does that make sense? Uh, but before that, here's Ulithi Atoll. Uh, as Nicole mentioned, it's about, it's the fourth largest lagoon in the world, depending on which source you're looking at. For only four islands inhabited and about 39 total sandbars and little islands here. And so um, the, the next slide here is, is the, the fishing jurisdictions. So each of these islands have their own fishing jurisdictions, which they maintain. And there's a system of trade within these islands and management that have existed uh, these, all this time. And so where does the canoe play in? You will see in a minute. So here's our canoe, the Ulithi uh, political structure and sharing collaboration structure within the atoll. So if you notice the hull here, can you see my cursor? No. Um, the hull of the canoe is sitting on the upper side of the um, screen in the Maumok jurisdiction. Maumok is our, uh, the paramount chief who holds the, the leadership of the, not only Ulithi, but the outer islands. And so the hull of the canoe represents that leadership. Uh, the outrigger is now sitting is sitting on parts of Fala, on, on part of Falalop and the fishing jurisdiction within Falalop, the red box on your right. Falalop being the larger island, uh, you know, provides all the crop, the taro and all of that um, land crops. But the point here is the interdependency of the hull versus the outrigger and the trust that must be maintained at all time for this canoe to sail forward. And so if you notice that the, the two sides, one is over by uh, Sokolai sticking out to more um, outer reef, outer water area, and the lower side being in the biggest fishing jurisdiction for emperor type of fish within the atoll. So each of these parts of these canoes function somewhat independently in managing their resources. However, there must be some cohesiveness within the atoll to, to be able to get this voyage successful. Now, one important point I think is it takes a village. It takes not just brave crew, but very strong multiple functioning parts of this canoe for a successful voyage. And so, so while Ulithi is somewhat divided up in jurisdictions, they have to work together. A point I wanna make on that last before we move on is, is it took us genetics from the science team to be able to physically see the connectivity with between these islands. Therefore, um, 
you know, confirming the interdependency of these islands. Uh, so for example, Giacomo found fish that were siblings from Falalap and Fetabul all the way down here by, by uh, Federe, um, and, and siblings from Esor and Maumuk. And, and that just adds on to the already um, established structure of the, the metaphor here. So we now are able to merge the science with this tradition uh, making it stronger and, and believable to the younger generation. And so that was one point I want to make on the, the collaboration of this now innovative canoe that will consist of crew that uh, make up your speakers today. Um, this is just to show you part of, uh, of the, the, the view and, and shout out to Papa Mao below who, uh, who, uh, who's the famous navigator. Uh, so to move forward, this, this slide, I wanted to show the different changes that has impacted, you know, not just the, his, the, the wars, uh, but different changes, including the influence of different religions that have come in. Christianity certainly plays some part in the, the change. And this has forged, forced us by no means any, nothing against religion here, but, but this has forced some management, tradition management to be ignored to some degree. Um, and so I, I wanted to elaborate on the change because it's these changes that have um, has contributed to, to some of the loss of those traditions. And we are now using science to bring it back. Yeah. So to replacing taboo based conservation with science based, if that makes any sense. And again, to add up to uh, what was pre uh, mentioned earlier, this is what it takes. Listen, listen, and listen. Um, and I totally appreciate this. And I can say this on behalf of a lot of people in my community because it took a while for us to really believe that when, when the science folks are saying, uh, uh, you know, what do you think? They really mean, what do you think? because we've seen numerous programs come out and, and very well intended programs come out and fail because it's, it's never really designed, I think, um, to fit our need. You know, uh, as a matter of fact, Nicole and I talked in length uh, and the rest of the team about using the word conservation because there's a phobia of no take. So how do you, how do you promote management in an, in an area where everybody depends on that resource. Uh, what, what one people has, one reef has done for us in these communities is, is give us a, a permission to be ourselves and to be able to still use the resource and manage it at the same time. And by the way, that is not a foreign concept. So once that's internalized and localized, I think the rest is history. I'm really proud to say that we have not spent one penny on policing in any of these projects, not one penny. So um, that says, I think speaks volume of, of the structure, the, the importance of community in these, in these um, very tiny islands. Um, and with that, I'm gonna lead a little bit into what One People, Hen One Reef has actually um, uh, spin off to, you know, we're hopefully after this call, we'll be able to attract some of you to support us in many different ways. And, and we'll talk more about that later. But one current project which we're partnering with is Island Conservation, also based out of California. This is Tommy Hall, and he's working with us uh, and the communities to, to look at invasive species. Uh, Ulithi, as most of you know, or some of you may not, is, has the largest green sea turtle nesting in the entire Micronesia, averaging about 80 to 100 turtles nesting on one of these beaches per night. Um, so my point is we're not just gonna protect these for, uh, there's, there's a lot of us here, citizens of this, this area. We're not just talking about human beings, but our turtles, um, our, our endemic uh, blind snake here. This is a snake um, that's endemic to only Ulithi. So island conservation with their help, we're able to, 
do some work in eradication of um, monitor lizards who are which were introduced by the the Japanese I believe for food at that time uh, monitor lizards and rats um, we hope that that would lead to to more crabs back on some of these islands and by the way this is where we're working on we're doing this pilot program with island conservation on um, Losiap, one of the turtle islands and so um, this is a pilot program and we are hoping to get um, to to be able to finish this with COVID we're able we're not able to do what we hope to accomplish this summer but we're hoping that this pilot program would work and would lead to the same methods applied to other communities within Ulithi Atoll and and other parts of Micronesia so this is just to show you of the site that we're working on uh, hopefully with the removal of um, monitor lizards, rats, and we've now successfully removed the pigs. Uh, this is just to show you the, um, the nest predations on, on, on Losia. Uh, about 90 to 100% of, of the nest here is destroyed by uh, feral pigs and monitor lizards. So that's a little bit cruel, but I'm sorry. So again, with, with Island Conversation, uh, Convers conservation. We built this camp. Uh, they've been working very, very closely with the locals, the young youth, uh, which you'll hear from them, uh, doing science work. Uh, I call it the reef transect now transferred to land. And so it, it also helped push our message and our, our work um, within the atoll because you can physically see what they're doing compared to what's in the water, which not all the communities have access to all the time. So this just to show you some of the work that Island Conservation is making happen. We've removed most of the pigs or all of it. Uh, th these pigs were removed and given to the community on the other side to grow, to raise. So they're not necessarily uh, doomed at this point. Um, and, and again, the last one, uh, with birds, we, we hope that removal of, of these um, rats and, and monitors will revive the, uh, will bring back the bird population, which will in turn um, enrich the soil and, and the reefs. And there's, there's new studies on that, but I will let the rest of my colleagues talk about in more in detail about the science. And uh, again, we'll be available after for, for questions. Uh, and with that, I will turn it back to our next speaker. Which would and I'm be... going gonna, gonna to come in here first just for a minute and just to, to let you all know that as we go through our talks here, um, our canoe analogy also applies to a canoe needing provisions. So part of what we're doing now is reaching out to all of you, for those of you that are interested in collaborations, in joining our donor circle, in donating this evening. So there are many ways you can get involved. And Travis is going to be putting in the chat some different ways that if those people are interested in donating, um, you can do that. You can also reach out to us directly if you want to have a conversation. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you. And that would be uh, John. Uh, I think Michelle is up next. I am jumping in now. Hello, Michelle here again. I will try to keep this short because I really want to get to the youth who are just the shining lights of this work that we do. I would like to share with you a little bit about what we're doing on the science team and remind you that this is rooted in listening. All of this starts with listening to the community and the needs and hearing about the issues that they're having. We do that before we conduct any of our science and then we listen to nature. We let the reefs tell their stories. And we do that in a variety of ways, looking at the corals, looking at the fishes, um, taking genetic samples. And from this work, we then have seen some big uh, differences amongst the whole atoll and some really different looking habitats. You can see some are really lush with corals and fishes and other ones um, are more degraded, especially the reefs that are right near the communities, near the villages on the inner lagoonal side. So we, we've seen these big changes and we communicate this back with the communities and share our science and have a collaborative conversation about what that looks like. 
And one of the really beautiful things that we've seen here is that the community has taken action and sometimes really fast action on this. And one of the first things that happened the very first year we went was after sharing that the reefs were sh showing a lot of degradation right in front of the community and on Falala Pulithi, that community decided to set aside a, a traditional a closure that they had not done in many, many years and revive that practice. And within a year, those fish had rebounded amazingly. That was uh, quite astounding for all of us. And a couple of years later, this super typh typhoon, Maysac, hit this island, absolutely devastating this atoll, taking down every structure, smashing every boat, leaving these people in this remote area quite um, isolated for some time. When we finally were able to join them a couple of months after this storm, we sat in community with them and they told us that they had to fish in this area that they had said to us that they would not fish in. And we asked them how it was. And they said, we fed everyone. All of us recognizing that this action that they had taken years before had saved their lives during this unprecedented disaster. So we do a lot of education as well and really sharing what we know about the reefs from a different lens, from a more scientific perspective and listening to their stories of what they know and really discuss some of the impacts of some of the changes that they have made over the years. And engaging that community, Nicole mentioned we conduct these fisheries workshops to train the community to take their own data on these. And so the fishermen have been amazing at this data collection and this incredible database that has hundreds or tens of thousands of fish in that. And we look at those data and bring it back to them. And really, and again, bring this collaborative idea back of really asking what is the best way forward? What are the best traditional practices? What are the best, um, the best scientific practices and how we can give that information to empower the communities to make decisions about their own reefs that are informed on the best possible knowledge in science and in their own culture. One of the things that they brought up to us that they were nervous about was a coral that was taking over these reefs. We had never heard of such a thing. We always thought coral was a good thing, but indeed when we studied it, we found that this particular coral did cause some um, limitations in the reef in terms of the ability to support fishes and snails that are important as food sources. And Giacomo will tell you a little bit about the genetics of that. But again, the community has taken a, a role and the youth have banded together and created this incredible monitoring program, not just on Falala Pulithi, but all the way across Yap State and Woolleyai. Not only are they monitoring these corals, but they are also entering those data and looking at them and taking a side-by-side -side stance with all of the scientists. It's a beautiful effort amongst them all. And we're seeing some incredible changes there when we shared with Mokmok some of the problems with this Montipara coral, they took immediate action and changed how and where they fish amongst their reefs. And on that reef, we are seeing some kind of recovery none of us would have predicted. These beautiful baby acropper corals and fishes that are associated only with certain species that we haven't seen in years return of huge schools of fishes that are really important foodstuffs. So we're seeing the actions are showing that these reefs are resilient and the decisions that the communities are making are really causing some support. So before I pass it off to Giacomo, I just wanna say that the scientists are really acting as the bailers on this canoe. The bailers are really important for making sure that the hull stays in integrity. We're paying attention to what's going on in the water and the oceans and making sure that we get to this voyage strongly. So let me pass it off now to Dr. Giacomo Bernardi. Thank you, Michelle. My name is Giacomo Bernardi, and uh, I am a faculty at UC Santa Cruz. I'm a fish biologist and uh, an evolutionary biologist. I've been uh, uh, working with One People, One Reef from the outset with uh, Peter, 
Michelle and Magul, of course. And then uh, one thing that is important is that Nicole and I brought our kids with us when we, uh, when we go there. And uh, uh, as much as Ulithi has changed our lives, it had also a very strong impact on the lives of our kids. Our son uh, was invited to a graduation ceremony for his own graduation at the high school of Mog Mog and, and he still talks about it and it was very important for his life. So uh, these islands have played a very important role for our family. Um, at uh, One People, One Reef, I've been involved in counting fish and estimating fish biomass, which uh, Michelle has talked about. And uh, I also did a, a lot of genetic stuff and the genetics have been focused on two species. The first one is what Magul talked about. We tried to estimate the connectivity between the islands and we used as a model uh, this uh, orange finned anemone fish, the clownfish. And by collecting them, we were able to do genetics and determine how fish are related between islands. And this allows us to look at the connectivity between the islands, how the currents influence each island. And that is very important ecologically, but also for the, the culture of the islands, because when one island does something on one island, then it has a direct influence on another island and it shows the connection between the islands. So that was really important. The other thing that I've been very involved with is what Michelle also talked about. It's on the coral Montipora. So on that coral, which is the next slide, on that coral, uh, what we have done is that we have looked at the population structure between uh, the different islands. And also we have looked at how corals disperse when there is the major, uh, ty when Typhoon Maysac happened, this is the coral. And when the Typhoon Maysac happened, it, it broke this coral and littered the, the ground with a lot of uh, small pieces of coral. And now we are analyzing the genetics of these corals to see if this is how this coral is dispersing. The coral is incredibly successful. And this is quote unquote, a bad coral because it is overgrowing the other corals. However, considering that the oceans are changing currently because of acidification and global warming, it also may offer a clue of what are the genetic and genomic factors that allow a coral to be successful in strange and changing conditions. And so currently we are being funded by the Catalyst Science Fund of Revive and Restore. And we are sequencing the entire genome of this uh, species and trying to get the genomic clues to understand why this coral is so successful and if it can help us actually uh, restore other type of more important corals all over the world that can survive in, in such uh, disturbed conditions. So Ulithi, I think, will may become a really important model to understand coral reef resilience in general. Uh, Michelle, you're going to hand this to the next speaker. And I just, I just want to say one thing here really quickly, um, just in case you all didn't, didn't catch what um, connectivity was about um, when, when communities are managing reefs, the reefs are connected. So the communities need to be connected around their management. So if you have one community managing a reef in one place, but another community is not managing a reef because the reefs are connected, you're not gonna get nearly as much advancement in your management unless, unless the managers are connected too. So this is why understanding connectivity is so important. Thank, okay. you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Nice. All right. I'm going to pass the baton off to John Haskins. All right. Thank you, Michelle. And, and thank you, Giacomo. That was great. Um, my name is John Haskins, and I've been um, doing uh, water quality. I've, I, my, my job with, with One People, One Reef is working on water quality and uh, combined with drone work. Which is kind of a unique, unique com combination. Um, I've been working in in um, 
water quality for about 20, 25, almost 25 years at the National Estuarine Research Reserve in Elkhorn Slough. But actually, I've been wanting to go out to Micronesia for ever since I was in college with Larry Rigatel, um, who Junior was just talking about earlier. So good to see you again, Larry. Um, so when I was, uh, when uh, Nicole and I have been talking for a long time, and so when she uh, came to me and said, hey, can you do some water quality and, and drone work out, out at Ulithi, I was just static. I was like, oh my God, I've been waiting for 25 years to get out there. So um, um, we have a program that's just been started. We just started in, um, in 2019, January of 2019 was the first time out there. Um, we, we, I took a couple of instruments, um, old instruments we had from the reserve, um, brought them out there and um, started getting some water quality because it's so it's crucial to get the water quality data. I mean, talk about connectivity. The water is, is the connectivity. And, um, you know, with these instruments, we can look at um, dissolved oxygen and temperature, salinity, pH, which are all, all crucial you know, dovetail very, very well with, with what Giacomo and Michelle were just talking about with all the sciences. Um, but we, we all definitely want to make it something that, that is what the community wants. Um, so next slide, you can see it's the community that, that makes this happen. And, um, and the community that, that actually, you know, I had no idea where to put the instruments out, but, but, uh, we, it was it was the junior um, kids were out there working the the youth that were able to help us get the yes to get the instruments out, um, and they're interested in things like like turbidity like how how is the um, the gardens what's the turbidity coming off of the gardens um, how is that affecting the reef or um, where are the are the hot spots and what time of year? So when those when those warmer temperatures are at certain times of the year, we can avoid those areas from fishing. Um, the next slide shows us what some of these instruments are. Um, I see Curtis from from uh, Sontech YSI is here. Thank you very much, Curtis, because this instrument here on the right was donated from them, and so we're able to. Um, use this super high quality um, instrument that has multiple probes on it to be able to, to get all of this data in one, one instrument. Um, this one on the left is a, is a, a buoy that was just donated. Um, this can give us uh, temperature data down, down below. So a lot of the um, temperature data that's, that's get, gotten out there is through satellite. Um, but when we have buoys like this, these are connected to the satellites, so you can get on real-time data. Um, but the temperature is getting down where the coral is, not on the surface. Um, and um, it's it's kind of funny that that the uh, um, what Junior told me was that the water quality, because you're looking at the water quality. How it's how it's um, symbolizes on the canoe is the the water quality is looking into the future. You know, you're looking out for what's coming ahead. You know, warning signs of what's coming ahead. Looking at temperature or pH, um, and that the what it is on the canoe that is the steerer, and that's the one steering the boat. Um, Larry knows me way too well to let me steer the boat, um, but uh, steer the canoe. But uh, um, I think I want to give this water quality program, um, bring it out to the community, bring these instruments out and teach them how to use the instruments and then they can use it where where they see is the most the best best fit. Um, the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about the drone work that I've done. Um, I've flown around for about five five years around the slough and in Central California, but this was and I've flown with with uh, lots of researchers and um, doctoral students and master's students 
but the crew out there on ASOR was probably the best crew that I've ever had. Um, they were my air traffic control, my ground crew, you know, the maintenance crew. These these all came out right when I showed up and everybody came out and and it, it was, I mean, talk about it takes a village. These guys helped me get around the island um, and somehow they were able to tell the next island, you know, we showed up at the next island and this the, the whole new crew of, of kids showed up. So um, May is going to talk about the youth program. I think this was the junior youth program that helped helped me out out here. Um, um, and the next slide, the next few slides I'll show are, are just some of the um, examples of what we can we can make from these um, drones. They call them flying cameras. Uh, you get um, um, uh, depending on the area, but you can get up to a thousand photos shot straight down, you stitch them all together and you make one big map. Um, this was uh, Bulbul, which is right near Losiep, which is what Junior was talking about, the Turtle Island. Um, this was taken in the late afternoon, so there's, there was no glare. You could see directly through the water right to the coral. Uh, when you zoom in on these maps, you can count the coral heads, individual coral heads. I mean, it, that, it's super high resolution um, photos. I mean, I could just look at this photo for forever. Here's Losiap itself. Um, and this is going to be fantastic to be able to have the data. This is this was taken right as the um, those mount monitor lizards and the pigs and the, and the rats were being eradicated. So this is just going to be a great baseline to be able to watch the, the um, island come back when, when those non-natives are taken off and the natives can come back and the turtles can come back. Um, it's going to be really fantastic. I could go on forever, so please put, put some uh, um, questions in the chat and I'll, I'll be sure to answer your questions. And I'll pass it on to uh, Supin, who's going to show, talk to you about her social science project. Thank you, John. Hi, everyone. Aloha. I'm Sukin. Nearly two years ago, I joined OPRR, One People, One Reef, with great excitement. Um, I have been a conservation social scientist for over 20 years, working in multiple cultures and biome. For me, uh, OPOR is a very special organization because it embraces the meaning of conservation, as understood by the Ulithi community. For them, conservation means practices and beliefs to care for their land and their sea. And its purpose is to use and benefit from the natural resources in perpetuity. So this means doing what is needed to secure the resources for food and for life so that future generations not only survive, but thrive. So I'm going to show my slide. And as I said, I just started um, about two years ago, I don't have too many pictures. Uh, Travis, somehow I cannot share screen, not sure why. Oh, now, okay, sorry about that. Okay, so as the official social scientist for OPORA, I have the privilege of helping the navigators maintain the proper speed line and heading. My role is to carefully attend to the physical, psychological, social, cultural, and spiritual conditions and health of everyone in the canoe. Because it is only with the support of the people that we can stay on our conservation course. We want to move at optimal speed while still protecting the welfare of those who count the most, namely the people in the canoe. Based on the results of social scientific studies, I whisper or shout to the navigators, depending on the significance of the findings so that it can make timely adjustment and can take new initiatives when people perceive threats or problems. Through these studies, we can also confirm when our sailing is optimal. Our studies include understanding how people impact resources through the way they use or manage them and how changes in nature conservation and resource conditions impact people. The future path for us is not only to know well the currents, the water quality, the condition of the fish in the reefs, but also to understand better what the community needs, their conditions, their problems, their priorities, their capacities, and their inspirations. 
By using this understanding and our collaborative effort with scientists from multiple disciplines, with communities, with their leaders and resource manager, we collaborate and are guided to learn from and support one another so that we can move forward together on the course that truly benefits the health of both people and nature. So with that, I'd like to pass on now to the lead scientist of our youth program, May Roberts. Thank you, Supin. Um, let me share my slides here. Because I can't, oh no, here we go. <laughs> All right. So um, hi, everyone. My name is May Roberts. I am a grad student. Um, I'm actually Giacomo Bernardi's grad student. And I first became involved in One People, One Reef um, back in 2017 and have been a I've been a supporting uh, scientist, but um, primarily have been the youth program instructor coordinator person. Um, but it's been incredibly inspiring. And I think you'll see why when you hear from some of them in a few minutes, but they're really um, incredible future leaders and really I have nothing to do with it. Um, but first, I'm going to give you a brief overview of the ULITHI Youth Action Program. These are some of our participants here from a year. Um, the youth program was started when the um, elders of ULITHI essentially said, you know, the success in reinstating traditional practices for resource management, it's, it's great and all, but it really will only be sustainable and is really only worth it if we can get the next generations on board as well, um, which makes sense. So at the time though, the general thinking um, among the teens of, of the communities was that, you know, the old ways are outdated, irrelevant. Um, culture is, you know, is dying, it's uncool. Um, you get the idea. But um, so what the youth program aims to do is to demonstrate that traditional knowledge and Western science are actually complementary ways to approach conservation problems or questions um, in the communities. And it tries to give the participants skills and experience in this really effective two-pronged approach to marine conservation. And so it's been a combination of um, a marine science field course and also connecting to culture and learning about traditional practices and finding the value in, in both of those. So each summer, um, we have eight students from the US um, come out to Ulithi and meet about 10 Ulithian students from across the atoll that handpicked by the communities to join us for two weeks and um, Obviously, this last year was canceled, but we have been meeting uh, weekly on Zoom uh, to work on projects together with those um, that have internet access. So it's, it's continuing and um, still really exciting. Um, but we do not have a whole lot of time. Um, so I have this hodgepodge slide for you. We do a lot of different things. This is a smattering of the things that we do in, in each of the categories, I guess. But um, I'm just gonna give a couple brief examples. Um, so as far as marine science, you heard about the Mantipara coral. The youth program um, plays a really big role in collecting data on the coral cover and the spread of the coral across the reef in Palalip. Um, they also learn, um, so we, so we train in you know, all these different survey methods of coral cover. We do sea cucumber surveys, marine debris surveys. Shout out to Fuller who's here. Um, we learn about the turtle monitoring. We learn about how to collect samples and all this stuff. And it's, it's really cool because it gives all the students this, this real experience. Um, but this, they're also collecting real data that then goes back to inform the communities. Um, which I think is pretty powerful. Um, and then we also spend quite a bit of time learning about different cultural practices, um, both from the elders, but then also the youth that are involved teach us a lot. Um, and we do this through various discussions and activities. Um, and this again is all to give value and appreciation for the ways that have sustained 
large populations on these islands for thousands of years. And, um, you know, that wasn't by accident. So it's hard to give um, just one example. Um, but uh, I figured because everyone loves sea turtles, um, I have a sea turtle example for you for how um, for how we tie that traditional um, we tie the knowledge of the traditional taboos that dictated um, that dictated the resource management with the scientific perspective. Um, so one of the highlights of the youth program every year is we all um, get on the boats and we go out to Galip Island, which is this really active uh, turtle nesting site. And we put on our red hand headlamps like two o'clock in the morning and, we, and the guys come around, they're like, there's a turtle coming up. And so we, um, we quietly like sneak around and we watch this like massive turtle just lug her big body up the beach and um, just laboriously dig this huge sand pit and lay all of her eggs. And um, we also often get the chance to see, you know, these baby sea turtles come out of the sand in the morning and make their way down to the beach. And um, I think it's a really powerful experience for everyone, but something that um, we learn um, from Junior is that um, he tells us about the, how the traditional laws dictated that sea turtle eggs could only be harvested in particular months. And so from a, and this was like a super strict law and, but from a biological perspective, when we, when we look at that, um, it turns out that these rules allowed the harvest of sea turtle eggs, but only at the very, very beginning of the nesting season, which means that these were the eggs that were going to likely be turned up by you know, the later nesting sea turtles that would come up and dig their nests over um, these early nests. So that it, um, it, it makes sense, you know, to have these, these, um, these original taboos in place. Um, and it's still allowed for people to harvest um, for eggs. Um, okay, I just have one more story. And this story is like, so it just makes my heart wiggle because it is um, one of my most proudest moments of my life. And I didn't have anything to do with it. <laughs> but um, uh, shout out to Eric Tong, who's here. Um, he, he was there for this. Um, but uh, so let's see, was it 2018? Back in 2018, a big group of us from One People, One Reef um, flew out on this tiny plane out to Woleai Atoll, which is, Junior, how far away is that? It's far away, like like a thousand Ks or something. Um, it's far away. <laughs> so um, we, so I was out there as a part of the science team and we were going out there to, as a jumping off point, to touch base with some of the communities that we've been working with um, in the outer islands. And so we were only in Wooly Eye for a short time, but uh, several of the youth from Ulithi who have been in the program for years uh, came and stayed on Wooly Eye for several weeks that, that, that we would be gone on the, other, on the other islands. So we basically just like left them there. Um, this Wooly Eye was a community that wasn't like 100% on board um, with us yet. Like they still wanted to see like what the deal was and they weren't ready to be like, yeah, come in and do, you know, take over. <laughs> Um, but, um, and that was when we left for the islands, but we came back on our little fishing boat. We like chugged back into the, into the atoll. And I remember seeing, uh, Clancy who's here and who you'll hear from and, and Milo. And they were just like yelling up at me on the boat. They were like, we did all the surveys and we filled up all the vials with fish tissue and we taught them how to do like sea cucumber surveys and we did fisheries workshops and I was like oh my god and it turns out like they really did they like galvanized multiple communities because this is an atoll so there's several communities and um and they pulled it together and they just on their own just ran their own youth program and more I mean like they did more than what, <laughs> than what we do um anyway I still get teary eyed just just <laughs> talking thinking about that. But um, talk about hope for the future with um, leaders like that. 
I, I, anyway, that, that is my story to end on. With that, I'm going to um, pass it off to Milo, who um, was one of these young leaders there. And he has been um, a part of the youth program since the very beginning, I think like 2014. And um, he has also been my right-hand man uh, ever since I, I started. He's, he's been a true youth leader. And so I am going to hand it off to him. Milo, please take it away. Thank you so much, May. Uh, <clears throat> hello, everyone. My name is Milo. I'm from Mildi. I've been uh, involved with One People, One Reef Youth Program as a Yildi Youth Representative um, since 2015, actually. Um, today, I will share how this um, One People, One Reef uh, Youth Program affects me and uh, others. Um, for someone to be in such a great program like this, there's tons of good things, that, uh, good things to share, but I only have a limited amount of time, so please bear with me. I would like to start off uh, with uh, uh, this program came in as a as a vessel for the youth, the youths to learn better about science and culture, and how it works hand in hand, and uh, also provide an opportunity to reach out to the outer island uh, youths to come together to learn and share. Together, we can discuss ways to tackle some of these global challenges. Um, Second one was the female inclusion. Having young local youth female to participate in all the activities such as diving, which is supposed to be immense work, they actually make a big difference within our communities by sharing most of the information and a great push of hope for the younger generation to follow. Lastly, for all of you who join our meeting today or this evening, we wanna thank you you all play a big role in this. Because of your love for protecting the nature gives me and all the younger Yildian uh, youth a way of appreciating uh, our culture and also gave us courage to continue to revive the traditional management and focus our studies on this type of fields to continue to keep our communities sustainable. At this time, I'll pass on to one of my colleagues, uh, Mr. Nick to share some of his experience with the youth program. Thank you. Thank you, Milo. Well, uh, hello everyone. How about day? My name is Nick Nixon and I'm a participant from uh, Flala PLD. I got into One People, One Reef since 2016, which is the second year. Uh, One People, One Reef youth program has affected me on all levels. It has connected local youth within the outer island and give us a chance and the opportunity to work together with the youth, uh, US youth as a team, community, and as a family. With One People, One Reef Youth Program has become an exciting and fun activity that we look forward to every summer. And I'm very grateful that I'm able to mentor other young youth and share what I have learned and experienced with the One People, One Reef. My experience with this youth program forced me out of my comfort zone and has challenged me to face my own fear, just like right now. Thank you very much. And now I am turning this over to my cousin Clancy. Thank you. Hello uh, again. My name is Clancy, and I have been involved for this uh, youth program on People on Reef since 2016. It's been quite a long journey, and I have truly learned many new things. I can now say I do have a better understanding of how modern science play an important role in helping a community to save and manage its resources. I grew up in a traditional society, and I believe I truly didn't know better. I'm grateful for an opportunity like One People, One Reef Youth Program where I'm able to be educated on how to help my community sustain and manage our natural resources and help the future communities. One of many uh, positive outcomes was actually to see the whole Yuji Atal community notice what we were doing was something beneficial to the people and for the next generation to come. Uh, the One People, One Reef Youth Program 
didn't only educate me, but helped me build my leadership skills, giving me the ability to reach out and mentor my peers in the other islands or atolls, which may help them be aware of what's happening in our waters, will affect us now and in the future. Um, therefore, I give my personal thanks and appreciation to the team. I thank you all for your time. Um, I'm turning it over to Aaron. Hello, everyone, um, and thank you for being here. Uh, the youth program of One People and Reef has truly influenced how I look at marine management. Um, growing up in the West, I was taught that science is the way. However, the program changed my view on how science and traditional knowledge don't have to be at odds, but can be used together to give a better idea on how to manage marine resources. Um, my time at OPAR, OPOR has shown me that the scientist community cooperation is key and is the future of marine management. The sharing of knowledge between scientists and community has helped me and many other students at a community college here in the US um, gain access to uh, important field skills, such as conducting surveys on corals and sea cucumbers. Um, One People One Reef has also opened the door for me to practice uh, skills, lab skills, such as DNA extraction and data analysis of real world samples. Um, the, these skills were not just science for science's sake, but I got to practice skills for and science for people. And th that is a science that can help guide real change for real people. And so that's, that, that was really meaningful to me. So, yeah. Thank you, Erin. And then next um, we have Ivy. Hi. Um, I'm Ivy. I was part of the youth program in 2019, so the last year that it happened. Um, and I heard about it from Nicole at Cabrillo College. And at that point, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do in, in the realm of science. I had kind of discovered my passion for it pretty recently. Um, but definitely going to Ulithi and being part of the youth program was one of the best decisions I've ever made. It was something I didn't think that I would be prepared for, but it turned out great. And I really enjoyed getting to know all the local youth. Um, and it was just really powerful to be a part of a project that had so much community buy-in and, and passion and excitement from the community um, and from the youth as well. Um, it's, it's hard to see how a project that has that much um, excitement could not work. So it, it was really, a cool experience and um, it's definitely inspired me to hopefully one day work on a project similar to this um, where cultural knowledge and science kind of work hand in hand because um, I think that that's definitely the way forward through a lot of the difficulties that we're facing right now. Um, so I'm really grateful for the experience that I got to have here. Thank you Ivy. I just have to pipe in there. Thank you so much, you guys. Um, if that didn't inspire you, I don't know what will. I hope that we have, uh, we're able to demonstrate the importance of a successful voyage with a crew, present and future multi-generational crew in order to get to our destination. So I hope that we were able to do justice for that a little bit. Um, and also, you know, this example, I hope that we can reach out to other uh, native native communities out there. I've, I've haven't heard of too much. I've heard of a lot of struggle and we certainly share with that. But I hope that this, this is one example of what can be done. A message of hope um, that's proven here or shown here and but also more especially for the future generations um, not just the indigenous people, but the professor, Western professionals to work together. I think we together we can create the Trojan fleet to be able to tackle these new challenges of climate change and, and changes we're experiencing now. So uh, with that, uh, I will turn it over to 
who's next? I will pipe in here and uh, and I, I'll just follow up on that and say that um, we're beginning to work with the Amamudsen tribe here in Santa Cruz and, and actually raised money for a scholarship to um, have one of their youth come out to Ulithi and then COVID happened. But um, so yeah, we're very excited about expanding in that way too. I, I just wanna take a minute here before we close it up and, and thank first and foremost, the Outer Islanders, amazing people. Um, I have so much respect for you, and, and we are also thankful for this work that we've been able to do together. I'm, I'm hoping that there's a few important messages that we all got from tonight, besides the fact that this is such an amazing team that we're working with. Um, one of which is that our planet is really at a critical moment in history right now with conservation, management, and human well-being, and the challenges that those have brought. We need innovative and inclusive solutions to address those challenges. We cannot do things the way we have been doing them because it isn't working fast enough. And we've been able to show an incredible and powerful movement in these outer islands by combining these two methods of management. And I do understand that not every place is the same and you cannot scale one idea up everywhere the same way. But I think the point of our approach is that it has to start with the community. So that's the scale up. It's, it's not a model to apply everywhere. It's an approach to apply. And that collaboration is really key to ensuring enduring success, not top down, but bottom up really. We have to have a diversity of ideas and, and motivation and knowledge. One People, One Reef is addressing protection and ensuring vitality of people who rely on resources by engaging in those collaborative solutions. And, and I believe so strongly that the people of Ulithi Atoll are a model for the world and the people of the outer islands and what they've been doing out there. Um, we are moving forward. Um, our organization is growing. Um, we have more requests than we can manage at the moment for communities to work with us, including communities outside of the outer islands. So part of what we're doing tonight is to let you know what we're doing, let you know how we're growing, and to give you ways that you can get involved. And I'm gonna pass this on to Birgit Winning, who's gonna tell you a little bit more about how you can get involved. And I also wanna give a shout out to the Cohen family who has given us a starting donation of $5,000 to match. Yes. So yes, <laughs> so um, if anybody wants to match yeah. that, we're gonna match that donation. Thank you so much to that family. Yeah. I think Travis is gonna put in the chat here ways that people can donate also um, so that you can either choose to do a specific fund or donate to a general fund. But I'm going to turn it over here to Birgit Winning, who's been with us from the very start of this project. Birgit. Thank you, Nicole. And I am a board member of One People, One Reef. I've worked in the field most of my professional life in the Central Pacific, the Caribbean, and South America assisting local nonprofits and communities with capacity building. I first came to Ulithi in 2005 to work with turtles, sea turtles. And over the years, I observed well-intentioned scientists and nonprofits come and go. But One People, One Reef had a different approach and it's one that has endured. And although One People, One Reef has since 2010, over time, it became clear that the work needed some institutional structure and backing in order to plan for the long term, to have autonomy and financial security, and to support the youth in their efforts for future environmental sustainability and food security. We became a prime profit this year for all those reasons and to allow One People and One Reef to respond efficiently and in a timely manner to concerns as well as opportunities. We hope you will spread the message of One People, One Reef. And soon we'll be able to offer many opportunities to volunteer and to assist in a variety of ways. But now what you can do to help is to donate. Any amount is welcomed, it matters, and it is appreciated. In regards to our canoe, donors are the people who represent the greater community. They help to make that voyage possible. So we invite you to visit our website, onepeopleonereef.org, where you can find a variety of ways to donate, including 
to specific programs, such as a youth fund, which is my favorite. And if you are interested in our funder circle, please do contact us and we'll send you information. And I believe Katie has some additional ideas on you, how you can help support One People in One Reef. Thank you, Birgit. Yes, um, give me one second and I'll share my screen with you. Um, While well, she's pulling that up, people, please, anybody who has questions, throw them into the chat. And I think that Travis yeah. will be keeping track of those. Okay. Are we on? We're on. Okay. Um, hi, thanks again, Birgit, and for everyone here tonight. And thanks so much for sticking with us. We have over a hundred participants this whole time. It's really amazing. All wow. these people around the world beaming in for this. Um, and my name is Katie McConnell. Um, I interned with One People, One Reef in 2019 when I was studying coral reef systems during my graduate studies in microbiology and risk and uncertainty analysis. Um, but I've been a fan of them for a long time after hearing stories about the doubling and sometimes tripling of fish biomass on Ulithi's reefs over time and One People, One Reef's approach to community-led collaboration. Uh, what I heard was happening in Ulithi gave me hope. So I'm happy to be able to share with you just some of the ways that people have been able to support One People, One Reef. And one awesome example is how we were selected to receive a free and very cool oceanographic data buoy from the philanthropic organization Aqualink. Increasing temperature is probably the biggest threat to coral survival and presents a dire risk of ecosystem services losses to the millions of people who depend on coral reefs, including the people of Ulithi and neighboring islands. So powered by solar panels on the buoy's floating surface component, um, the Aqualink buoy takes continuous uh, temperature measurements at both the surface and at depth where the corals are and where satellite surface ocean measurements don't reach. It also takes um, wind and wave measurements. All of this information is uploaded live via satellite to Ulithi's site profile where it is stored and becomes part of a global open source network of long-term coral reef environmental data and will serve as important evidence of climate change for any audience across longer timeframes. One exciting feature of this buoy is how the Aqualink dashboard includes a bleaching alert system. This is made by drawing from what the most recent science has shown about the physiology of coral bleaching and may help local leaders make decisions before, during, and after marine heat waves. This buoy has been proposed to be installed on the reef where the youth program has been monitoring coral cover and the spread of the concerning Montipara coral for many years. We hope that by investing in the youth program, we can encourage the next generation that their work has real value and real world relevance and applications. And it's true, because when we take a step back and look at some of the current goals at local, national and global scales, we can see that a lot of the work that is being done in Ulithi plays an important part in creating intergenerational equity in the world together with initiatives that the Federated States of Micronesia and the United Nations are currently implementing. For example, the United Nations set a goal of 30% of the earth protected by 2030 as part of the UN Conventions for Biodiversity, Climate Change and Sustainable Development. And Micronesia has committed to those goals by pledging to protect 50% of its marine and 20% of its terrestrial areas by 2030. To do so, Micronesia has just implemented a national protected area network, which by the way, One People, One Reef had a hand in rolling out this year. In Ulithi, all the work that the youth and community leaders have already done by reef monitoring and management would make it very easy for their reef to join the protected area network, contribute to local, national and global sustainability goals 
and set a precedent for more communities if they so desire. The decade long relationship that One People One Reef has had with Micronesian outer islands is now strengthened by its 501c3 nonprofit status, which allows One People One Reef to operate in Micronesia at a national level and respond to the growing request for assistance by more islands. Um, and as it's been said over and over tonight, this voyage needs all hands and there's a ton of ways to get involved. Um, one of the easiest ways is to just reach out. You've heard from just a small sample of the tons of interesting and varied projects that this organization has been a part of. Um, so please check out our website, onepeopleonereef.org, and you can read more about them and discover all of the ones that we haven't even had a chance to talk about. Um, also, we recognize that each and every one of you in the audience tonight are literally from all over the world um, and from so many different walks of life. So if you feel inspired to reach out to us with an idea, question, comment, partnership, or even just to say, hey, please do. You can always email One People, One Reef um, or click the contact form link um, that's been in the chat. Um, you can also sign up. We have a once a year newsletter, so we won't be like spamming you all the time. But if you want to like stay up to date, uh, there's a pretty comprehensive newsletter that goes out once a year, sometime in the fall. So usually after a field season. Um, we're also very active on social media. Um, you can follow us on Instagram, One People, One Reef. And our Facebook page is also um, a really great hub for information. And one of the most active places where you can find how to get involved with projects, online virtual meetings, etc. And the last thing, um, this is not quite ready yet. I just got an email this morning that we'll be ready to do this by probably by the end of this week. But you can choose us to receive 0.5% of anything you purchase of the purchase price of anything you purchase on Amazon. So it's Amazon Smile. If you haven't heard of it, everybody should just do this anyways. It, it's no cost to you. All you have to do is just go to smile.amazon.com and then you click the little drop down menu that says Amazon Smile. And it takes you to your charity dashboard and you can choose a charity. You click the button and you can search for One People, One Reef, select us and there you go. Anytime you buy something on Amazon, just make sure you go to smile.amazon.com to do the purchasing and we'll automatically get 0.5% of that transaction, um, which seems like a little bit, but it's pretty amazing how a little bit can add up very quickly, um, which is so true. <laughs> so anyways, um, thank you so much again. Um, and I'll turn it back over to our founders. Thank you so much, Katie, and, and thank you so much to everybody. Um, there's been some questions coming in, so we'd love to be able to answer them. But first of all, I just want to thank everybody for coming and being a part of this tonight and for thanking our amazing team. Um, if you want to learn more about the structure of OPOR, the directors, the board of directors, the leadership, and all of that stuff, we have um, profiles of people on our website as well. Um, uh, with that, I would just love to, and we can go, we can, I think we can take up Zoom as long as we want to, but for those, I think we have a question here from Mike about oil and oil leaking in Chuuk. Um, let me try to find that question. Um, so the U so Mike Mayer, who's here, wrote a book about the USS Mississinewa during World War II. He wrote some fascinating books, actually, about Ulithi Atoll. I recommend them. Um, and the USS Mississinewa was a boat that was um, uh, taken out by a Kaiten um, underwater torpedo. And he's uh, asking about, has oil residue been a problem in areas such as Chuuk? And I believe so, Mike. In fact, I just heard from somebody who talked about that problem. I don't know much about it, but I did talk to somebody who had mentioned it. I believe it's also been a problem on Ulithi, and they sent a team out there to try to plug that boat up at some point. But um, 
Um, so I do believe it's a problem, but I, uh, ironically, I don't think it's one that's been looked at carefully, right? I mean, you probably know that more than most of us. Um, Mike is a historian also. If you want to pipe in and, and say anything, please feel free. Yes, uh, Nicole, the uh, U.S. Navy civilian contractors took 1.9 million gallons of fuel off the ship in early 2003. The internal fuel bunkers, that is the oil that powered the ship itself were not accessible. And so that internal oil is still there as well. And so um, I know when I was there in 2013, um, because of all the oil residue in the water, the, the wreck was almost devoid of marine life at that time compared to prior to mm -hmm. the first leak starting in 2001. Uh, also, I know there's other sunken craft um, at Ulithi, I know that, you know, in Chuuk, well, you know, there's also many sunken craft. So my curiosity is, is that, have you done any tracking about oil residue affecting the work that you're doing in marine life and the reefs? So it's a really interesting question. And um, most of the work that's been done there has been less about the oil, but more about the iron from the ships because iron is a fertilizer and iron causes algal overgrowth. Um, and yes, we have seen some really interesting um, uh, corallomorph growth and other patches of strange stuff happening on some of the islands. And um, one of which we did, we, looking at historical records, we did find there was a munitions dump right near where there's a big corallomorph colony. So there may be some connections there. Yes, we haven't actively started looking at them yet, but um, we've started to see little hints of them and they are interesting and very important. Thank you. And, uh, and Vid, Vid says oil continues to leak in the World War II wrecks in Chuuk. So Vid, who knows a bit more about Chuuk, has said yes. So they have been finding oil um, leaking in Chuuk as well. Yes. Yeah. Um, Alex, what other communities will you be expanding this approach to? Can you also expand it to other ecosystems like seagrass or rocky reefs? That's a really excellent question. Thank you, Alex. Um, uh, so currently we're looking at expanding to other communities of the outer islands um, into Chuuk. So we have worked a lot in Yap State. Um, we would like to expand into Chuuk and beyond. We're working with the Protected Area Network implementation rollout for the Federated States of Micronesia. So we're hoping to work with more communities across Micronesia as they roll out their Protected Area Network plans. Um, bringing into that process the community voice, which is I think inc incredibly important. And yes, Alex, this method can be utilized in other ecosystems. In fact, we've been approached by people interested in um, applying this to forestry management as well. So um, we happen to be marine biologists, but um, this does not need to be a marine biology or coral reef program. It's really the approach. Um, Sue Pin talked about her role. And I think that the critical thing here is not just collaborating with the communities, but collaborating as a team of scientists as well, including a good social scientists. So it's really collaboration all around to move forward in ways that make sense for all parties. Um, Michelle, you have a question from Vid. Uh, yeah. There looks like there was a question from Tobias. Uh, as a student at Cabrillo, how can I get involved at the school? Ah, so at Cabrillo, we actually have a, a program. Um, a lot of our youth actually come out of Cabrillo simply because I'm affiliated with Cabrillo. <laughs> um, and they come out to the islands. Uh, so you can get involved by um, emailing us and emailing me and putting yourself on a list. Um, that's one of the ways. And also often involve students in internships to help us analyze data. So there's a couple different ways. So reach out to us and let us know you're interested. And we'll put you on a mailing list um, for, so that you can learn more. <coughs> Great answer. Um, Michelle, Thank you, Nicole. We've... Uh, Michelle has a question from Vid directly, I think. Well, I also wanted to just add on to, um, for the youth, I put in the chat some of the connections for on our website. There's a page where you can look at opportunities for youth. You don't just have to be at Cabrillo, but youth anywhere that want to get involved in the program. Um, so you can see that page on our website of the Youth Action Pro Project, as well as um, the link to Blue Ecology's website as we look towards the future of hopefully being able to travel there again soon someday. So we welcome you all. And um, I also, uh, I wanted to address a question, but I also felt remiss in, in when I began to speak, I wanted to be sure to honor the land at which I'm sitting and speaking to you from of the Chumash, who are also an important ocean community and I just want to um, give my respect to the people who tended this land and water that I live in. 
So I wanted to also thank Vid for being here um, and representing Chuk. We were so honored to be able to have a visit there in 2017 um, when we sailed across all of Yap. And he's asking if the, um, is how the national and state governments of FSM and Yap are supporting our efforts. And uh, we, have, we have been working closely with them and always every time we are there, um, making sure that everybody is staying informed. And we've recently been involved in the protected area network manual that um, maybe Nicole or Katie wants to talk a little bit about since you were working so hard on that. Um, Nicole, you wanna jump in? Yeah, and Chrissy Canlis, who I saw was here, oh, um, and, and Katie, who was here. Um, and, and all of us actually at OPOR, we're working on the operations manual for the protected area network as they roll that out. So we are hoping not only to help influence the way that manual is implemented, but also to actually support the implementation of that program. Because we have, um, certainly I've been involved here in California in the Marine Protected Area Network, and a lot of Western approaches to that is to do it very top down. There's a rule, it's a law, often it's a bill, it's a law and you get committees together and then somebody says, what's your input? And actually, thank you very much, but here's how it has to be done anyway, because it's the law. So we're hoping that we can use a different approach here and not only invite the communities, but actually listen to what they have to say and, and let them lead in how we need to roll some of this out. Because if we don't do that, I'm afraid that a lot of these protected area initiatives just don't go as far as they could. So we're very excited in that initiative um, as some of you probably know, the Compact of Free Association, which is an agreement between the Federated States and the United States as a result of World War II, that compact is ending uh, here in a couple of years. So we're reworking, not we, not me, but the US is reworking that agreement and how to um, give support both financial and technical to the outer islands. So we are also hoping to influence that process to be able to uh, I don't want to use the word divert, but to be able to um, earmark more funds into these more community-based initiatives that really celebrate community leadership. We have another question from Dina uh, and a great comment. So I'd like to share that. Your community-based approach and success combining culture and science to revive traditional conservation practice is amazing and inspiring. Do you share this model and provide Zoom presentations with other research universities? Oh yes, all of our team actually has been very active. Um, Junior and I last year were um, the plenary speech at the Society for Conservation Biology's international meetings. So we have as much as we can, we get to the international as well as our local stages. Um, Michelle Paddock has given talks, Peter Nelson, Giacomo Bernardi, Junior, yes, um, all of us here have, have given talks. Um, we don't do as many Zoom outreach events like this. Perhaps we should do more of them, huh? Yeah, so thank you for that. Is that Dina? Is that the Dina we know? Dina? Yes. Hi, yeah. <laughs> nice, Dina. Hi, Dina. Hey, Dina. <laughs> yes, and I just want to also say that um, I know that there are a lot of other educators out there, and we, we do welcome collaborations, and we would be more than happy to interact with you and, and work with ideas. So please um, reach out and stay in touch and we'll, we'll find ways to spread this. The whole point of this canoe voyage is to continue to sail across the waters and bring connection and bring, bring us all together. As you know, our, um, I mentioned in the chat, means unite this atoll and it's not just yes. the atoll, but it's the islands of the entire ocean. And so we really, we really welcome opportunities for you all to um, work with us in all the different ways. On that note, uh, I'd like to be very cognizant of people's time. Thank you all so much for joining us. We are currently 13 minutes over our, our one hour and 30 community meetings. So it's supposed to end at uh, 8 p.m. We encourage everyone to still stick around if you'd like to ask us more questions, but we do have links in the chat yeah. to stay involved and get in contact with us. But uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you all for being here and, and so much for being a part of this community meeting. And I have to say something really funny, Travis, to follow that up. The community meetings that we have many, many community <laughs> meetings. You knew this was coming. Our, our one and two hour community meetings are often six hours long. <laughs> Although this one won't be, I promise. But <laughs> 
Yes, indeed. Um, you know, I wanted to point out that we in this team come from a variety of backgrounds. We have a very strong science component. We have science and education. We have youth development. We have community leaders. So there's really, um, we really have a very collaborative approach, not only in our approach, but also in our team makeup that you've been able to see tonight. And I, we didn't all have a lot of time to tell you about our own backgrounds, but some of that information is on our website as well. I want to add to that because I'm quiet because of time, but normally I'm not I run these meetings over way over. Um, but to, to add to what's mentioned, Nicole just mentioned, we on the local level are just as involved in all of the components of this. And so I want to, I want to assure you of that, that we, we hope that whatever projects that you help support, uh, we will be able to, to share back with you so you know um, what, what we're doing, uh, what, what you're supporting, and you get to see real life what, what uh, is happening with your help. And so I want to assure you of that. And our, on the local level, we're just as this is what I guess uh, is making a, a huge leap for us on a local level, I think, because we oftentimes we hear this word authentic collaboration, but really, what does that mean? You know, is it because you're listening to me or is it because, you know, you're implementing a program I bring or I support, but until recently and until my involvement with this amazing group of people, which I'm hoping to grow with all of you, uh, it's just recently been like, also, oh, does it matter really? Like what I think matters is not completely obsolete. And boy, that has given life to a whole new energy on, on the local level that I can't even begin to explain. And so, you know, hopefully you stay tuned with us. Hopefully you're, you're in touch so you can continue to see um, how this voyage end up. But really we need your provision to, to, to help uh, get us through. And, and I think we'll do great things together. With that, I'm fumbling here, but I really truly thank you. On behalf of the community and the team, uh, past, present and future, that's Yuluthian for thank you. Uh, I really, truly appreciate this evening and thank you so much for sticking with us over 15 minutes now over time. And I am getting some questions in here, um, actually <laughs> several questions on my own text <laughs> of people okay. who want to know how to donate. So the, the links have been being posted in the chat. There's some links there, but if that's all a bit too much and overwhelming, which I get, there it is again from Travis. Um, you can go to just our website directly, onepeopleonereef.org, and you can also email us if you rather or would like to, to um, discuss or talk, you can go to onepeopleonereef at gmail.com and we will get that directly. So those are two ways that are kind of easier than reading all the different links that are <laughs> being posted in the chat. Um, on our website, there's a direct button for that, for those. I, I'd love to hear your feedback. I'm sure all, all of us do but our contacts are all on the website as well. So if there's any particular interest or story or whatever that you wanna hear more about, I'm open to, uh, to you guys reaching out personally on, a, on, the, on our personal emails. And so please feel free. Um, uh, I think uh, this voyage is gonna be a fun voyage. Uh, we're gonna turn into a fleet, so thank you again. Yes, we are gonna turn into a fleet, that's it. <laughs> We need a fleet. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, thank you. And if anybody has any last minute questions, we're happy to answer them. Otherwise, um, or comments, I mean, or comments, or comments, feedback, absolutely. Um, Emma, Emma is here. Emma Lassiter, who was the Emma. backbone of our work for so long and still is. Emma, hi. Hi, Nicole. Nice to see you guys. <laughs> Emma. Thank you. Yes. Okay, let's see. Okay. Okay, is that it? Yeah, we, we'll just we'll stay here until everybody's gone. So if you want if you all want to sit here and stare at our faces. <laughs> Ron, Any thank questions? you. Yeah. Mike, thank you. James. Hi James. Kanita. Hi Kanita. Now I can see you. Scott. I see Scott. Hi Scott. <laughs> now I can see Juan. Hi. Hi, hi. We can see everybody. This is fun. Did we go through all the questions? That, oh, Tyler. That, Tyler is here too. 
Just having fun looking at, at familiar faces here. <laughs> James. And Mary and her family. Hi, Mary. Hi, Larry. I saw Francesca there for a minute, too. Hey, Eric. Hey. And Eric, yeah. Juan, thank you, Juan. Yes. You're here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Shout yes, out I'm here. Yap. No, I didn't know anybody was tuning in from Yap. What's going on? Okay. I'm here. <laughs> uh, we're okay. Our ship is scheduled to depart on the 11th, uh, for probably next week or following. On the 11th for the Christmas run. To the right? Scott, welcome. You've been here. How many people came in there, Nicole? Can you tell? Yes, I have the total list. Uh huh. I, I don't know exactly now. 135 or something. Yeah. Well, thank you guys. Appreciate yeah. it so much. Yeah, yeah.